all of these techniques are stolen from civilian sport trainers. Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm already, right now when you're saying that, I'm imagining, how would I do that? Again, all these techniques we're talking about, bro, my power biting shit that I've stolen from many different trainers, this, this power and control stuff, be it the bark fence, it is all 100% stolen from top brilliant civilian sport trainers. If we close our minds off to very qualified, brilliant civilian trainers like yourself, man, I think we're, we're cutting ourselves so shallow. Like it's so, it's, it's, we're doing ourselves a massive disservice to the industry. Now, there has to be qualified individuals. But I think we have to kind of move forward in a mindset that says we have to not be blinded by the fact that everything that we do up until the time teeth hit skin is dog training, it's sport get, training, right? Go and get it, with no hesitation. This that never quit. What is going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Elevated Canine Podcast. And today, I don't have Roel with me. He's behind the camera. But we have my brother Justin, my brother Eric. They just finished uh, doing a seminar out here. And then they uh, presented at, what was it? The uh, CNCA conference. CNCA conference. So, uh but before we get into anything, guys, I wanted to just share some of our sponsors that we have. Uh, Canine Culture Collective. They have slip leashes, top, top quality. They have some foam balls with nice paracord on them. And then they also now have apparel. So make sure you guys check them out. We will make sure we post the link. And then we also have Underdog, who, you know, Underdog's always sponsoring the podcast. So anyways... Justin, Eric, what's good, fellas? It's all good. I just got to piggyback what you said. These, the folks from, uh, my bad, too, too far away. These kids were hooked me up. They're so generous, kind, very skilled and talented, man. I can't thank them enough for their generosity of always hooking me up with the top gear. I talk a lot about the use of the dominant slip lead, um, whether it's reactivity or minimizing handler aggression, whatever it may be. This is my absolute go-to, and I can't thank them enough for this quality they continue to produce top shelf gear yeah. and they designed those uh, those colors were just for yeah for you, know, you right being in tennessee man ut's orange and i always like that orange and black theme so they hooked us up this whole scheme for me personally and uh really nice. cool the double stopper we know that sometimes when you get in the mix that this thing will slide a little bit yep uh they got me the, the we call this 1094 in police work this is a little backup nice to make sure that this one doesn't slide man so Cool, 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 cool. Eric, what's up with you, man? man? Same old, just enjoying the cooler weather here in California and no humidity. You come from Florida, right? Yeah, it's hot down there, even yeah. in January. Even in January. I know I was going to give him one of the underdog vests, but uh, it's a little too hot out there oh, for them. The yeah. prototype you got, though. The that one's going to be nice, bro. That yeah, one's, like it's going to be here in two weeks, so you guys will for sure get some of those. Um, anyways... Let's get into it, man. Yes, sir. Eric, I know uh, some of the people are familiar already with Justin. He's been on the podcast already. It's He's our first one that we had twice, right? Outside of like Chris. Oh, yeah. Outside of the elevated trainers. Right Justin. And he, it's probably one of the most viewed podcasts as well. Uh, you know, he always delivers uh, good information. And this time you guys came down and you guys talked a little bit about, uh, what was it? The bark, the bark, the bark fence. Yeah, right? power and control power. is what we're calling it. Awesome. Power and control. Bro, let's talk a little bit about that, and then, uh, yeah, we'll go from there. Far away, man. Well, you know, for me, when, when I see talent, when I see skilled people, man, I'm, I'm compelled to, to, as your business says, elevate and do what I can to, to spread the word. Eric and I linked up back in South Florida many years ago, man. I've been re retired six years, almost six years. It's crazy. Valentine's Day will be six years, bro. Like It's gone by in an eye blink. But we linked up, man. We're uh, neighboring agencies. I, I worked in Palm Beach County. He worked down in Fort Lauderdale, Broward County. And uh, I think what connected us was tracking, right? Yeah, Dick Stahl stuff. Yep. I had brought Dick Stahl in twice, actually. And uh, his hard surface tracking system is just absolute gold, man. You can absolutely teach a dog to vacuum pavement in the hood. And uh, I bought in. And uh, whether he was just curious about a dog or the system or had a problem dog, I don't remember. He can elaborate. But that's what connected us. We always have mutual friends and in the game. And... Uh, you know, we're very big, uh, kind of, we didn't plan this, but we're very big on giving credit where credit's due. We, I'm a thief of intellectual property. I'm very transparent about that. And I didn't invent anything I talk about. I just kind of tweaked it, stole it, morphed it, and kind of regurgitated it in a way maybe some folks can grab and some dogs can understand. But Eric's dedicated a lot of time, personal time, off the clock, not department time, to uh, enhancing his education with some extremely talented people. He's taken a theory and a system and enhanced it 
into another dimension that's applicable to all types of forms of aggression. I'd like to get into the theories and stuff, but you know, I want to just kind of turn it over to him and, and give him maybe a little background about yep. how he dove into it and found out about it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, just fortunate to have a lot of great mentors and people to learn from. Um, you know, went up to the Dick Stahl seminar just wanting to learn more. Tracking was our bread and butter and still is in Fort Lauderdale. And so wanted to learn a little bit more, met Justin. And then after that, I was calling him up and asking him questions all the time. And he was always, you know, very upfront and, hey, try this, this, and this, and got some great information. So, um, you know, from there, just continued to want to grow as a trainer. You know, I think in uh, police canine, we see a lot of trainers that are just stuck with the information that's passed down from generation to generation, and not too many are going out and seeking out new information. So, you know, people coming to the seminars and the conferences, it's great, you know, and uh, guys looking to learn new information and take it back and do something different. And recognizing that, you know, the, the ways that we did things before can be improved upon. So I just, just kind of ran with that, met some really good people and some great trainers and, um, you know, was fortunate enough to learn a lot. And I, you know, was given the opportunity to start sharing it went at hits, you know, out, um, the first one was where in Orlando and, um, you know, it all kind of stemmed from me wanting to just share the information because of the struggles that we went through in our unit, the things that we had problems with, I had found solutions to from other people outside of the police canine community, mostly. Um, so I wanted to share that and, um, that's how the class kind of started. And, um, you know, now we're doing the power and control thing and they just, they just jive well together. You know, Justin's power biting, uh, the bark fence, they just, they, they really mesh, whether it's police canine, uh, which is mostly what I'm gearing it towards, but you know, it fits for all the sports too. So let me, let me ask you this. How, how long have you been a handler for? So I've been a handler for 16 years Been with the agency for 19. All right. And if we were to, you know, if I was to ask, uh, what, what was some of the biggest changes that you've seen from when you first started to today? In canine? In canine. Um, I mean, the biggest things are, you know, back then I was taught that you can't have power and control at the same time. Like if your dog is obedient, your dog is, um, you know, out clean. If your dog looks pretty out on the training field, that he's going to be a weak street dog. And that's what, what I was taught and what was, you know, preached for many years. Uh, I feel the complete opposite now. So that's the biggest change that I've seen for us, um, you know, but we still see a lot of it. We we're fortunate to get to travel around the country and teach all over the place. And um, a lot of agencies and a lot of handlers still feel that way. And it's a shame because it, it doesn't need to be that way. So that's the biggest thing. And then just you know, moving away from just strictly compulsion and just all, you know, all pressure based training. Right. So, I mean, even in like the personal protection side of things, people, some people still believe like same thing, you know, uh, I'm not going to teach an out for the first two years of the dog's life and so on and so on. Like, what do you have to add to that? You know, it, we look at global events, man, and how it has a trickle effect down to the American street cop and what we do. And, and I was sitting in the academy when that first plane hit the tower on 9 11. It was a day that changed the entire scope of the world in this country, and we'd never want to go back to that, but bring me back to 9-12, man. Like, the world supported police, and we could do our jobs, but when that happened, the, uh, the, the dog industry took a massive turn where the global demand on dogs went through the roof, and uh, the supply could not fill the demand, and everybody's jumping in as breeders and vendors and you know, back 30 years ago when I started this shit, you could you could go to Holland and uh, drop 2500 bucks on a Camp V trial field and and get basically a mass murderer, like a dog that's just a savage, right? And uh, they were about two, two and a half years old. But to get a PH1, it's a long time to get that training on a dog. But we're, again, 30 years of techniques were different. Things were accelerated today. But long story short, it was a savage dog, two, two, two and a half years old. If you can get that fucker in a crate, onto the plane, off the plane, out of a crate, into your kennel, it's the, fi the first box is checked. You're going to get your shit tore, tore up and murdered. <laughs> Uh, you took that dog, you put into your shitty old ground and pound techniques, right? And that dog didn't tear you up in that process. You had plenty of horsepower to hunt and eat on the street. So you do believe that the dogs were way better back then than they are today? They're, they were much stronger dogs. They're, they were the more one percenter type of tier one, uh, incredible animals with, with a tons of drive, high levels of aggression, and you couldn't break them. You, 
could not break them, man. They were just different. They were mutants. And they're few and far between now. Do you think that us, you know, obviously the new techniques in dog training have changed that as far as, you know, 100%. the type of dog that people are breeding for? Yes. So, uh, you know, I say this in every circle I train and I think the, the girls smoke the dudes, bro. Like in handling, there's so many girls out there killing it in decoy work. You know, the law, law enforcement girls putting in a lot of work. I know this Eric's trained a bunch of gals that are out there doing it. But on the sports side, like women getting into dog sport and kicking our asses, right? They don't so much want that old school dog hanging from us, right? Like back in the day, like Eric was saying, if the dog didn't bit us, bite, sorry, bite us, we didn't want it. We thought it was a bitch. Like if it didn't, there was no handle aggression, it was soft. But I don't think the gals wanted that so much. So what that, what's happened over time, and don't get me wrong, plenty of girls can handle, handle aggression. I'm just not saying, trust me, and I've, I've gotten kind of some heat about trying to be sexist or whatever. It's not what I'm saying at all. I'm talking about, a, a gals that prefer a dog that's sporty, drivey, but user friendly. Me too, bro. Like, I'm over that. Like I'll never be a hand model. Like I'm torn up. I'm over getting bit. But what I think the combination of the dogs being much younger now, like now the vendors are telling you they're 14 or 16 months old, bro. They're like, there's no way, but with that little bristly, fluffy coat, with pearly white teeth, they're acting so immature. They're maybe nine or 10 months old. Got it. If you put that old school ground and pound pressure type training and aggression type work on these dogs and Back then, like I said, you had to do very little development. Like they were about it. So now the dogs are much younger. They do have the, the genetic blueprint for the work, but now they need more nurturing. They need more developmental time. So what the systems like this do is it, it taps into something deeper within the animal, right? And with the power and control stuff, you maybe have, folks have seen it online or, or on social media, is we use, utilize a bark fence, right? So it's a three-sided fence. We're standing up, I'm about six feet tall. It's about waist high, right? And it taps into a theory, a deep theory of barrier aggression. And it's something that the pet owner experiences. Like when the mailman comes up to put mail in the mailbox. It's natural to most. Yeah. yeah. That barrier is there. It puts the dog in like this guard, guarding defensive mode where it also offers like a layer of security and insulation where because that barrier is there, they act out in a way that you wouldn't normally see if that barrier wasn't there. And they go for it. And when they're, they're snarling, they're growling, and they're like all in trying to murder you through that barrier, whether it's chain link or it's a window or the, or the back of a car, there's some really deep emotional hate flowing through the animal's veins. Like there's some hormonal shit that's going on that we want to capitalize right. in our forward aggression. So part of the system is getting the dogs to, to stay quiet and pray, which I'll have Eric kind of elaborate on. It's, it's a very hard thing for people to grasp, right? Yeah. But from the bark fence, right? I'm kind of fast forwarding. I'm giving you the end picture and then Eric will cover the keeping dogs quiet and pray is that while they're in that hormonal state of barrier aggression, bro, like they want to murder you through that. The fact that the fence is three feet high, we can mark that emotion and pay the dog and pray over the fence. And when you channel from that forward aggression where the dog's active and barking and the barking that we want to see behind the fence is not the yippy prey barking that a lot of barking isn't barking like that. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You have that undulating high pitch, inconsistent kind of chaotic flow. It's not something usable because it's a very, it's a, it's a mixed kind of chaotic mindset. So the barking we want behind the fence and when a dog is on target in the real world is, is really clear. Showing rhythmic. teeth. Well, that's teeth, you know, teeth are, are more, again, there's no absolutes in dog training, man, but teeth as a whole are a defensive posture where the dog's trying to put on that show to make the conflict go away. Like we could talk yeah, about Yeah, 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 no, I, I get what you're saying. I want forward active offensive aggression. In the beginning, it can look a little defensive, bro, because the dog's behind that fence. He's, he's feeling like he's in guard mode, but it's that rhythmic pitch, cadence, tone, rhythm with guttural power. It's wah, wah, wah. Let's go back a little bit. Yeah. Because I, I feel like a lot of people think that because dogs are showing their teeth yeah. that they will, that they want to actually bite. Yes. And really, it's the opposite, yeah. I believe. It's yeah. more like, get away from me. Yes. I'm not so sure about this going on right now. When you see that rigidity, when the dogs are like up on their toenails and shit, and they're hackled up and they're, like, they're showing their teeth, like they're trying to put on a show to whatever they're conflicted by, hoping that that threat goes away. Right. When the threat does go away and it happens pretty quickly, that can manifest into offensive aggression. That's kind of the theory behind our boogeyman stuff. Yeah. Which we could take a dive into that too. But but yes, as a whole, again, there's no absolutes. There's plenty of dogs that are hackled up that will will eat you, right? But it's usually like a zone defense, right? And there was a gal that posted a video last night, actually, a super trainer, and the dog looked great. He was on a table, like an elevated, like the tower of power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she was so happy that the dog was in defense. 
And I said, there ain't nothing defensive about that animal. I said, it's pure forward offensive aggression. Right. Because it had animated, had animated body language of prey, but such a dedicated, like powerful mood. And the barking was just that, bro. It was yeah. get me off this table so I can handle shit, right? And there's, to me, there's a difference, right? And, and, and I, mean, I mean, you've seen a bunch of dogs like this, Eric. I mean, I think it takes the eye to really be able to mark that bark that you want. You know what I'm saying? Like I, feel, I, cause I see it all the time. People trying to reward barking and they, they think they're doing something good for the dog, but then the dog just gets locked in this game that they're playing. Yep. And I think something that I saw this, you know, this weekend that Eric was doing, I do a little bit of, of, of that stuff, but I see you guys doing it here uh, where you guys really try to get that different bark. And so what are some of the, not that I'm trying to make you bark, Eric, but <laughs> what, are, what are some of the differences that you see in barks, uh, you know, that you like to pay? Well, posture is a big part of it. Is the dog moving backwards, forwards? I'm trying to read the whole dog, you know, so it's it's difficult to just nail it down to the bark. But I want a cadence. I want eye contact. And the fence really makes it easier because I'm right up against the fence and the dog is three inches from my face, you know, so being able to read the dog gets a little bit easier there. And that's a big part of it, right? So I'm putting social pressure on the dog by staring at him, kind of showing my teeth, trying to, you know, you know, act like a dog somewhat, make them feel threatened. And um, when they feel a little bit of that, hope that they bring out a little bit extra. So, you know, maybe the barking in the beginning was undulating and and kind of preyish and and all over the place. And I, I really stare them in the eyes and get a little closer and blow on them. And they give me one or two barks where they just get a little bit nastier and I'll mark that. And then it just gets a little bit more and more. And, you know, I don't want like a def defensive bark the whole time, but we're just kind of breezing the surface of it, touching the surface of it to bring out a little bit more because the whole thing revolves around the dog's emotions. Right. Right. So if we can bring out the right emotions before the dog bar bites while they're barking, then they get paired together. You know, the, the biting and the barking get paired. So having to describe it's a little difficult, um, you know, ears forward, ears up and forward and the dog, you know, pushing into the, the, the toward into the back tie towards me is huge. And, um, you know, I don't want to see the dog jumping. I don't want to see him bouncing side to side. Right. I want them really focused on me. And, yeah. and make it about me and not about the equipment. So they're not staring at a toy or they're not staring at a sleeve. You know, all they can see is me face to face. Yeah, I think, I mean, I feel like dogs should be able to fight with their bark, right? I mean, that that is something that we need to teach dogs to fight the threat with your bark. And they should be, they should know that they could beat you with their bark. I mean, that's from the, looking at it from like the shuts inside, the sports side, like it's two separate um exercises the actual bite and the bark are two different things right. and an, another thing that i that why i like doing it that way and i know you guys talked about it was because then you're able to cap a lot easier when the dog understands when he can bark when he can't bark when he can bite when he can't bite so on and so on and i know you guys did that a lot this past weekend man. And, you know just to talk more about the prey barking and you know barking is a, d a demonstration of an emotional mindset like it's not just yapping to sound off like there's a reason and a purpose behind the dog giving that audible expression and it's demonstrated in the pitch and the tone and the totality of the bo dog's body language so that prey barking is so super yippy and people think barking is barking it's not man so a big part of the system the very first part of the system is getting the dogs to be quiet and pray there's a couple ways we do that you know and it's, it's sometimes it takes uh, tools like these you know because when you're using prong and an e-collar um, to mitigate aggression, sometimes it makes it hotter. It makes it worse, yeah. You know, back in the day, we were cavemen, bro. We used to put a dog on a back tie with a sharpened prong, and it was fucking out of, in outer space. It was super hectic and chaotic mindset. We thought it was power, right? Right. So what happens sometimes, we have to get the dogs to keep their mouth closed in the presence of prey, and, and why this tool is gold for me is because it'll restrict a little bit of that blood and oxygen to the brain. It's a, it's a calming effect where an e-collar or a prong is like giving someone anxiety cocaine. All right, this is your Xanax, bro. This is your Xanny bar. It's going to cause a little bit of uh, uh, calmness and fixation. To, and mechanically, it's going to close the mouth. Like if we're sitting here having a talk here and 
Royal comes up with his gorgeous hair now. If we could put the camera on his hair, but <laughs> I haven't seen him about a year ago. It's fucking like five years old and shit. Yeah. If I was sitting here talking and someone wrapped me up in a rear naked choke, immediately I'm going to brace for that contraction and shut my mouth. There's no longer a conversation going on. So mechanically, this quiets the mouth. And we can cap capitalize on that in a moment. So once the dog's quiet and pray, then we're able to bottle that up, right? Because that energy still has to go somewhere, right? So we obviously want to transfer that into the bite. And there's a lot of nuances to the system, man. We can eat up two podcasts doing it. When the dog's quiet and pray in a natural drive state, then when we go to the fence and they're allowed to express that emotion, it is 10 times more. It is a form of capping, absolutely. And to give like another analogy about why I don't think dogs should bark and pray, and again, bro, I start so many Facebook fights with this kind of shit. Like people <laughs> lose their minds, bro. Like, if you imagine a herd of elk, bro, eating lush green grass out in Yellowstone, man, it's like the beautiful grass, you're eating, chilling, life's good, and all of a sudden the wolf pops up over the hill, and the wolf's like, your dinner. Is that wolf going to sound off to those elk to make them run and flush them, and give them a heads up? No. Bro, I just heard you say that this weekend, and then I'm reading that book, and they mentioned something very no similar shit. to that, yeah. I, you know, it's not copy, because I can't read shit. No, no. <laughs> I, know, I know you told me you haven't read that book, but you know I was what's, like... What's wild, bro, is beagles, bro. Fuck. Beagles, fuck beagles, bro. <laughs> They'll sound off. They'll sound off. And I think because the beagle's brain, bro, it's not about that food acquisition or wanting to bite shit. It's I think the beagles, again, I'm just guessing, bro. I'm putting myself in a beagle suit. Like, I think it's about like managing the the hunt, like a sounding off, like you got the flank, I got the flank over here. Like I think it's more about um them signaling to each other who's got what, but I could be wrong. But as a whole, man, a predator should be quiet and pray. Why do, why do dogs bark and pray? Well, a lot of times the restraint, man, being on a back tie. Right. If the dog could come forward and get you, he'd shut the fuck up and come eat you, right? But because he's back tied, it's causing a frustration where he can't go forward. So that energy is expressed through the, the mouth and inappropriately and, and prey barking. So being able to squeeze that and stop that is step number one. Yeah. And I think that it, I mean, I'm also, I'm also guessing, but I would say that's one of the reasons why in the shuts in IGP after the escape bite and there's going to be a reattack. Now, a lot of people are just getting the dog to be quiet out right. and just stare yeah. because when you catch the dog barking it is very easy to give him a grip and he's not going to get the same exact grip that he would get if he was just yep. really putting all his focus into the actual bite yeah and it's the timing too bro like as he's barking up and down yep. if a helper is not your friend bro all he has to do too is easy. time it <laughs> it's too to easy go up over him and you got a bad grip and you're pointed it's too easy yep so, for sure so again man we've seen amazing results and like i said eric's putting this stuff into real time on the street yeah and Another another thing that I saw uh, Eric do was uh, introducing a lot of, you know, I mean, the dog had to be focused on him and not the equipment. So you guys threw suits, sleeves or whatever down like two sessions in, you know what I'm saying? With the with certain dogs. Yeah, that's kind of his his newest addition to that, man. Like he's fast forwarding stuff a lot, too. And for me, like I had my last patrol dog was a dangerous animal, man. Like I, I, I did a lot of shit by myself, bro, because he everybody was on the menu. You know, he's not a, a dog you could work with a team, and I'm not a tactical dude, so it was a shit show. But I know the, the value of team neutrality. You know, again, the, the way things are being searched and the tactics that are coming out are, 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 are behind, way beyond me when I was in the yeah. game. But now, like I train with a group on Oregon, man, they're doing things a whole different level for the safety of everybody. And But the dog has to be neutralized yeah. to the team. Can we talk a little bit about that, Eric? Yeah, yeah so, um, you know, if you think about a dog that's in that – really aggressive, excited mindset. What does the dog want to do when he can't get to what he wants, right? The, he's barking. He's just super agitated. They usually redirect onto, you know, toy, sometimes to the handler, sometimes to backup or whoever's around. And that's what we see in the police world is the dog knows the bad guy's there. The handler's restraining him, can't, won't let him get to him. And now the dog goes, it's got all this energy and it wants to go somewhere. It's going to take opportunity. So behind the bark fence, we're just teaching them that that's not an option, you know, and we do that by flooding them with toys. So we're not putting one toy back behind the fence where they can obsess over one toy. You know, we're putting five things back there, you know, bite suit, bite rolls, sleeves, all that stuff. And, you know, it's, it's pretty simple to get them to get them off the equipment. Everyone freaks out. Not everyone, but a lot of handlers are like, oh, my dog, you know, he's really equipment oriented. Usually the second session, I, I do one session with no equipment back there. The second session, we're flooding them and they might look at the toy, but 
as soon as they look at me and bark twice and I pay them, then they go, okay, that's what I do. Like, this is way more fun. And not only is the biting me more fun, but the act of barking is so rewarding for the dog. The behavior itself is completely rewarding. The dog just feels amazing while he's doing it. And so, you know, the behavior becomes the reward in that case. And then you guys will put the rest of the team there, I'm guessing, like a bunch of different, uh, you know, part of whoever's going to go into the dog and then other officers right next next right. to him or you guys don't do too much of that yeah we're doing that um it at the bark fence you know neutralizing the dogs to people being there so we put decoys in bite suits inside the bark fence so they're all within range of the dog the dog can bite any one of them at any time we can throw police vests on them make them look like cops got it you know do the dogs really pick up on it i don't know you know maybe we could put some uniforms on top as bite suits but um the whole point is don't redirect you know, focus on that passive and civil guy. And so if I'm on the, if I'm decoying on the outside of the fence, I'm laying there in the, you know, in the prone position or in the fetal position, not giving the dog any reaction. And the dog is just sounding off at me when he could be biting any one of those decoys, but you know, he's not allowed to. Right. And, and that carries over into the street a hundred percent as far as team neutrality. We've done things where, you know, uh, a guy mentioned that, um, you know, when, when his backup drew the gun and their, their arms came up out in front of them, that that keyed up some of the dogs. I actually heard someone at um, CNCA talking about that too. So just that prey movement of someone drawing their gun and pointing their gun, you know, is going to draw right. the dog's attention. So we started doing that behind the bark fence and the guys in the bite suits are doing this. And you just created enough hopefulness that, I mean, the dog understands that he eventually is going to get a bite on that fence that you could start introducing new pictures with the fence and make it very easy for the dog. It's a known thing to the dog, right? Yep. Everything, anything we, anytime I intro something new, I go to the bark fence. Like the dogs are most powerful there. They feel great there. Um, so when I want to intro leg bites, I'm doing it at the bark fence. When I want to intro, I neutralize them to the muzzle, but then I want to introduce muzzle fighting. We do it at the bark fence. You know, so the dog already knows what's going to happen. They have the emotions attached to the barking. So let's bring those emotions for the first time into muzzle fighting. Let's bring those emotions into biting on the leg. It takes away the dog's ability to stop and think about and wonder like what's going to happen next. And I think that's what causes a lot of failures when a dog is a little bit unsure about what's happening next. Right. When the dog is barking, he knows what happens next. What's that song? I know what happens next, but <laughs> it, it's biting. Yeah. After barking is biting every single time. You know, and there, I mean, do you guys do in, in IGP uh, shuts and we do a lot of like barking, 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 barking. The guy runs away. You down the dog. Do you guys do any of that type that type of stuff or it's mostly always it's going to be a bite? It's mostly always going to be a bite. Um, we'll do some of that, you know, just to cap the dog and to show, you know, so maintaining the dog quiet and prey. That would be a good a good exercise for that. So. We'll quiet the dogs up and pray before we start the barking, which is a, a super important step. Like a lot of people want to skip over it and just get to the barking, but you really got to do it. Some of these dogs, they love barking so much. And this is, you know, not too many of them, but they start carrying over the barking into prey again. Right. So then we got to go back to doing something like that and show them like, hey, just because that guy's running away doesn't mean you can continue to bark. Right, 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 right. You right. know, but um, usually... With the police dogs, we're ending a session with um, bark, 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 decoy runs away, hides in the bushes, passive. Now the dog goes out from the bark fence, has to search for him, activate his nose, locate the guy, and then go in on a passive bite. Nice. So just just to bridge that gap between you know the barking and what he's going to see out in the real world. Right, right, right. Yeah, there's so many pictures you could change with that. You right. know, Once you have that as your foundation, I think. Yeah, you could do a bunch of different stuff. You, know, you got anything to add? Yeah, with typical swipe culture, bro, they want two sessions behind the fence and then magic. You know, it's not the way it is. I mean, in order to install muscle memory and create these conditioned cues and follow with the emotions is that it, t it takes time and repetition. It's not forever, but you got to spend some time there. And, you know, there's another guy in Florida, Ronnie. Uh, I call him Mango, bro. He's got a real <laughs> long Italian name. I, I saw, Magniello. <laughs> I saw it put into motion live. Like, you know, we, we take these techniques, and Eric's putting them into lo motion in real time on the street. But I went down and, and trained with those guys a little bit. So I set up a, a muzzle scenario in a hallway, um, narrow hallway, pretty long. It was probably about 30, 50 feet down. Ronnie was laying passive in the shorts and a T-shirt. 
several deputies in suits with with uh, tack vests on, given commands. The dog comes up and at, and the dog gets target locked on the passive suspect, gets sent, and as the dog's navigating his way through the cops, like they're sh they're like checking him into the wall in a suit, and the dog's like Oof, get away, and muzzle smashes the passive suspect at the end of the hall, bro. Like that ain't no joke, bro. That's some heavy heavy shit, and I can see the transition to the street and. You know, something I want to touch on too, man, all of these techniques are stolen from civilian sport trainers. Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm already, right now when you're saying that, I'm imagining, how would I do that? And I'd probably be like, oh, a backline dragon, people popping in or whatever, and you're just dragging the dog in or whatever and finally giving them a bite or fighting the guy over there. It's, it's interesting, man. Once they get target lock, um, they have like that tunnel vision sometimes. So you'd be pretty amazed about um, the neutrality For a dog sure. can, can ex you know, be focused on, but... Again, all these techniques we're talking about, bro. My power biting shit that I've stolen from many different trainers, this this power and control stuff, be the bark fence, it is all 100% stolen from top brilliant civilian sport trainers. And I don't think in law enforcement we're giving them enough credit, man. And, you know, the problem, the good thing with social media being a blessing about connecting us all and seeing all these techniques and, and the systems, you know, we put everything out there for free. Like, he's a little bit Im Im uh, limited about what he can post because of his agency's policies and shit, so I put it out there for him. But, you know, everything's out there, bro. And, it's, and the thing about it is, is, like, you can see these techniques, and if you don't understand the principles of the deep understanding of how, you're just going to do kind of copycat shit. But I think... As cops, we have to, and I'm retired now, and I've come full circle, man. You know my story. I started off as a civilian trainer, got saw the police dogs and just got hooked. And and uh, I was doing IGP in Schutzen, and the director of the Schutzen Club was also a cop in charge of all the canine training in that area in Connecticut, and he, he, saw, he opened that door for me. I had that person to open that door. So if we close our minds off to very qualified brilliant civilian trainers like yourself man i think we're, we're cutting ourselves so shallow like it's so it's, it's we're doing ourselves a massive disservice to the industry now there has to be qualified individuals right there has to be people that are out there doing it and then the problem with with law enforcement and trust me i know a lot of criminals with fucking badges bro so don't get me wrong but <laughs> the fact that like, we incorporate civilians man there has to be like background shit and the, you know a lot of dumb shit bro like but the problem is, like, we're, we're still a little bit narrow-minded. Like, I still go, we go, we get asked to host these seminars, and we always ask, can civilians come? Because cops are cheap fuckers, too, bro. Like, they don't want to pay for shit. <laughs> you know, civilians are going to pay for their education. So we always want to open those doors. But I, but I think we have to kind of move forward in a mindset that says we have to not be blinded by the fact that everything that we do up until the time teeth hit skin is dog training it's sport training right i can't you know don't come to me for tactics man i'm not that dude but i can talk to you a little bit about street stuff too but we have to open our minds to that dimension man so yeah yeah and just to touch on that you know um i mean it's no secret i tell everyone everywhere i go and teach this that i got this from mike lorraine he's down in palm beach just incredibly talented trainer that i've learned a ton from and you know he deserves the credit and um you know so i've taken what I've learned from him and taking my interpretation and, and I'm teaching it, but um, you know, it's, it's difficult for civilians, you know, to get into the police world and I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it, it just is what it is, man. It's yeah. tough, but you know, I'm trying to get people to open their minds up to listen to more civilian trainers in the police world, but it's just, it's tough, man. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I, I get it, you know, uh, some of it, because you you never know who you're going to be bringing in. And I mean, you know, you guys say it's they say it's like a brotherhood and all this stuff. I don't know, you know, but I just feel yeah. like <laughs> but I just feel like I understand why they don't you know, it's just a sport. You're playing for points. Right. You're not playing for real life, which for me, I feel like I understand and I get that part of it. I will never go and say. Uh, I'm going to teach, uh, you know, all the tactical shit that you guys are doing and all that. I don't know any of that, right. but I could teach you how to play with your dog and how to have a better relationship with your dog, right. which I feel like it's one of the downfalls when it comes to some of the police dog training that I've seen so is that there's problems. no connection there. 100%. Everything is literally, well, the dog should have already known this, 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 and then they just put them out there and they expect things to get better. But they're 
some of the people that I've met in the police world or that go like that went to your seminar, the first seminar and all that, that are uh, continuously seeking more information. You could just see their dogs compared to the people that don't, 100%. you know what I'm saying? And so to me, it's like, if I'm going to be doing a job, uh, if I'm going to be, if I'm going to be into a police officer, I'm just saying if, if I wanted to be in SWAT or whatever, I'm going to try to put out as many rounds as I can to practice whatever I'm going to be doing yep. in that job. And it has nothing to like, you know, competition shooting ha probably has nothing to do with real life scenarios, but muscle memory, I'm sure it helps for something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm talking out of my ass, not, no, but, and I see the same thing with dogs. I feel like if you can communicate better with your dog and have a better relationship with your dog, a thousand percent, Huge. you're going to operate better as a team out in the real world. So, we suck at playing with our dogs, like cops. And, and I say it, and you know, you have to look and say, are are you nothing other than an obstacle that your dog has to work through to get what he wants? Right. Because that's the relationship that most police canine handlers have. Their dog is sees you as what's blocking them from what they want. And that's, right. that's not a good place to and, be. And when we don't even have to go to cops. I mean, just regular pet dog people. If you only knew how to play with your dog and establish some rules during the play that will go a long way with your relationship with your dog. Uh, just regular pet dogs. So just imagine police dogs. Holy shit. Yeah. Yep. You know, <clears throat> if we could merge these two worlds, you know, better. I feel like a lot of good comes out of it, you know, and it, it's unfortunate. I know there's egos on both sides of it. And, and I think that prevents a lot of it from happening, but um, I, I'm, I've learned a ton from civilian trainers and I'll continue to, seek out new information. So very grateful for, for everything I've learned from all the different trainers. I've yeah. learned from. No, and I learned a bunch from, from Mike as well. And, you know, but again, I think people like Justin right now are that are, you know, a little more involved with like, you know, getting into pet dogs and all that and just dog training in general. Man, that's, that's what that industry needs. In my opinion, you know, the police dog industry yeah. definitely needs some of that. So you know, the, the evolution that's happening, it's, 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 it is happening slowly, but what's going, the deal is like, dinosaurs at my age and older that generation's dying off in law enforcement they're they're now in upper management and they're retiring off and this next generation under me and eric's age and, and younger than that has grown up on social media so when they go out to like canine training and think about being a decoy and they come out and see like a choke chain a dog you know handler getting dragged around by his dog bro <laughs> even decoys like right. i mean just having a dog in front of a decoy that knows what he's looking at, that should be huge. Right. You know what I'm saying? So they, you know, they see these PSA guys and gals, and they see uh, rings training and the and the canine street team, street league stuff. Bro, and the level of control is mind blowing, and the dogs are full of power. And you see these these young kids are saying, "Wait a second, bro! Like, there's something better out there." And and those dinosaurs are still hanging on for dear life. It, it's they have nowhere to go. Like they can't they can't deny the fact that that information is available now. Sure. Right. And just like the conversation we had about dogs being young, like they have to be built in that way. And, and again, for me, like Nepo Po is my, my, my go-to game and the preparation of the animals for pressure is so, so important for all those aspects, man. But it's, um, you know, I, I put a brevet on a dog, my retired police dog, man. The sports are amazing. Um, I wish I had time for them, man. Again, the level of training that's just escalated over the years. Is, is yeah, crazy. man, it's crazy. If you don't put in the time, you're, yeah. It's like X Games, bro. Like when I was a kid, if you did like a flat, uh, a tabletop on your BMX bike, you were like the neighborhood G. Like right now, they're doing it at like three years old. And <laughs> bro, like, triple front flips, bro. It's tennis, crazy. Man. The like, evolution of of dog training is crazy, man. Wow. And even sports, like you're saying, like look at like a hockey player now. Oh that's yeah. coming at 18 years old is like you know better than Wayne Gretzky possibly, you know what I mean? Right. So it's just crazy how everything's evolved. And we, you know, as humans, we just get better and better at, you know, a lot of some things we suck at and get worse at. This is kind of like off subject, but today I heard, uh, I was on TikTok or something. I heard this coach talking about how, like, no matter how good the skills are that your kid is, like in whatever sport he's playing, he's never going to be better than like the kid that is genetically so he's like like so he was talking about like a uh, basketball right he's like hey your kid could dribble he could do everything but he's 510 compared oh, to the one that's 64 you he's, you're never going to compare like you know what i'm saying and i think it's the same thing with dogs cuz i'm like yeah like you could have the best trained dog but genetically if his heart isn't there oh yeah yeah 
Genetics are everything. He's going to get ran. That's the yeah. thing, bro. Like, the training masks a lot of weakness, too. It does. And I think that's why is a, there was this old guy that got into a TikTok live that I was doing, and he was talking about how the dogs are ch- have changed now and all this. And I think it really comes down to sport, um, you being able to do something with a dog in sport and thinking that that is what qualifies him to be bred, which then produces right. dogs of not the same character as the dog that's maybe a little bit harder, better genetics. But I think the breeders that know don't care about that. They'll look at the dog overall. You know what I'm saying? Title. Yeah. But um, but I think that is one of the, re- in my opinion, one of the reasons why dogs might not be the same caliber. Oh, people say that it's not the same caliber as before. Yeah, I, I think it's all in play, bro, but nobody wants to deal with that dog either. Like my last my last patrol dog, Zeke, man, he's, he's a throwback, bro, and I'll never ever do it again so let me ask you this if you think that you would have if you know what you know now with zeke as a puppy you think he would still be the same dog yeah he's you know he's yes 100 percent, bro because the more he started biting people like he was with me in my shooting and he mugged that guy from temple to temple bro like he, he was starting to short circuit like those got wire, it those wires were arcing and that's a genetic trait like the street like the genetic blueprints there the training and experience like painted that picture of what he is but the more he started biting people like it took him about a year after i retired to de-escalate wow uh, he was bro He was gonna be a problem eric do you notice a big difference in, in change when dogs get their first couple live bites and everything you do it, it's not every dog though you know some dogs they're the same dog now i do notice a difference in the way they work uh, we talk about fear scent and i, I truly believe in fear scent which, which is you know an experienced dog that has apprehensions on the street knows the difference of Uncle Larry, crazy Uncle Larry that's sleeping in the shed versus the bad guy that's hiding in the bushes that's scared to death and he's putting off different... You think you it's know, scent? Yeah, I think it's Absolutely, scent. Bro. The dogs have a completely different reaction to that once they understand like, oh, that's what got me the bite before. So my dog would still tell me that, Hey, there's someone in this shed, but you could tell the difference. Huge difference. Wow. Huge difference. So, um, but some dogs, you know, completely change after a couple bites and some dogs, you know, pretty much stay similar. Stay same. Got yeah. it. Yeah, bro. It's like growth hormone for their drive, bro. Like their food drive goes up, their toy drive goes up, their hunting instincts go through the roof. And, you know, my, I've been lucky to see it several times, my own personal dogs and dogs that I've trained. So it, it, they become addicts for that moment, you know? And, and like Eric was saying, there's a hormonal signal, signal, a chemical signal coming off the human body. Like we know that the dog's nose is superior. It can dissect small particles of scent but they can also decipher and, and break down chemical signals, right? So I guess for a geek term, like I'm talking out of my lane, it'd be considered pheromones. Like you ever hear those cologne commercials, bro? Get all the ladies by spraying this cologne, this pheromone. But I think that's like the hormonal signal that's coming off of our body that we can't control. Like I, I still feel it that sometimes. Like when that, that call comes on the radio, bro, like no matter how many times you dog bit people or you've been in shootings or whatever you've been into, like when that call comes out, when you know it's something you put the dog down, it sounds like it's good or it's another cop, you know, screaming for help, bro. Like there's something that pulses through your veins that you cannot control that response. It's the same with a bad guy, no matter how G'd up they are, how much time they've done, bro. They're, if they're willing to fight and die and not go back, they're still spitting off this signal much different than you and i chilling here and it's an amazing evolution for the dog to be tracking in a highly contaminated urban environment and to be like eh, you're not it you're not it eh, that's the motherfucker i need to get and it's crazy bro and they become addicted to that and the only way to train for that is life yeah there's no no training technique now maybe these scientific gurus bro can come up with that actual right. cologne bro like there's no there's nothing that prepares a dog for the street like the street and that's the hard part. And when we, and a kid came up to me at the class today and he's like, ah, I work for a small agency. We don't get any bites. I'm like, your dogs have to be better because you're going to face that one percenter. Like down south when, during our heyday, bro, it was nothing for dudes to be gals to retire their dogs with 100 bites. Like it was it just was every fucking week getting something. And the dogs get so experienced. Like you can do all like people ask about tra- tracking techniques. And how do we start the dog? How do we prepare the dog? Once I start eating motherfuckers, bro, you're just an Uber driver and you dump them in the crime scene and they're like, I got this. Just hook in and let's go. It's amazing to see, bro. It's amazing shit. Damn. Wild. And, and uh, 
Something came up, man. I think I was in Tobias's class, man. Tobias Gustavus, Gustavus, mm -hmm. yeah. Today, I mean, this in a, week in the class, bro. Brilliant dude, like with detection and tracking and stuff like that. And the topic of being obedient to odor came up, and like our dogs had permission. Like it's not something you even teach, bro. They had, they were very good. Like the dogs can do rock star obedience. Like Eric's dog, incredible. I had my dog in a down, bro. We had this manhunt going on. And uh, we had three or four dogs cycling out. Man, this kid had stabbed his father, and he was on the run in a small, like, pretty small area in Royal Palm Beach, Florida. And uh, my dog was smoked, bro. So I put him in a down. I had another canine handler come over, bring me some water. And uh, a lieutenant came up to say, hey, what do we got? Like, they wanted to reestablish their crimes, whatever. I was sitting there chilling, and the, I felt the wind come across my face. And the dog almost ripped my shoulder, my arm out of its socket, bro. He took out the dude was hang in the bushes or across the street. Man. That wind just it just hit the right element, but he had he had has permission to break obedience for that odor, and that's not something you ever teach him. It's something they're so addicted to that chemical signal, man. It's again, it's like they become like wolves, like legit hunting their prey. Man, dogs are amazing. It is wild, bro. It's wild. So, you know, I, don't, I think we've only scratched the surface, man, of the dog's abilities. Yeah, and you know, for me, being banged the fuck up and trying not to decoy anymore like the nose of the dog is even more fascinating like the things that are going on with with the abilities of their nose especially. yeah man i mean because i tell people all the time like man i'm not the best trainer but somehow these dogs figure it out so yes. it's one that you know what i'm saying like these dogs are smart man like yes. people all the i mean you know a bunch of people we use clickers and markers and this and that bro but we had people doing amazing things with dogs without any of that stuff as a matter of fact i, I watch omar von Mueller, who does like movie stuff Gifted, train these dogs to do some crazy and you watch his training bro and he's not you know oh don't move before you you know you that click and like, bro this and he just fucking gets it done yes. yep. and that's how that's how smart dogs are and obviously he's a phenomenal trainer that knows how to piece all this together but yeah i think dogs are yeah it's crazy so if there's a, a dimension of dog training bro you haven't fucked with or a trainer you want to see like where where's where, where your geek at bro like where are you going next what do you want to see? What do you want to do? Um, I want to get into the law enforcement side of things yeah. just for me as like a, almost like a hobby. Like, you right. know, just cause I want to learn something new. There ain't no money in it. I don't that. care about the money, bro. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I'm good. I'm, we're all right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, as far as that, I want to get into that. I've never met Bart. I would yes. like to meet Bart. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like that's somebody who I learned a lot of stuff from without even meeting them, just off videos yeah. and stuff. Amazing. A lot of my training is based off of, you know, some of the things he says. Yeah. So, and yeah, I think, you know, obviously, you know, Bart, so I do, man. You know how it is. I definitely. Look Let's talk a little bit about, about that, about yeah. knee, knee po, po yeah. which is, I said, it's not really knee, but you know, I think it's po, but it's all right. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Cause, uh, you, you, you've done the class, you're doing the classes and whatnot. Uh, what is, uh, you know, what is the whole, the whole thing about? Well, you know, it's a system that's constantly evolving and, and Bart and Michael, who are the, the inventors of the system, and it's copyrighted and trademarked. So if you talk about Nipopo and you don't have that brand, or you don't put that circle with the R in it, the Nipopo, Popo will come swooping down and <laughs> get you. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a copyrighted trademark system that they've invested quite a bit of time into and money. And what it simply is, is that you're the architect of your own system. And there's, there's precepts and foundational concepts that we like to adhere to, but you are in charge of your own system. And that's why my interpretation versus, um, you know, other, other practitioners that are out there doing it, it's going to be very different than Barton Michael. That's the cool thing about it. Let me ask you this. If there was one thing that like you heard, I have, I have a, uh, like a video in my mind that I first watched Bart. from Bart. Yeah, I know exactly what, what you're talking about. Uh, what is something? What do you have one like that you were like, like when you heard it, you're like, like this is it right here. Like a training technique, or just or, or just like in general. I'll tell you which one I'm. Uh, what video I saw that I was like, and he's like the hunting bird. You know, he's like when he gets hungry. Yeah, he's like he goes and he hunts basically, right? Yeah. He's like, and if he misses, what is that going to cause? And basically, it's like the bird is now hungrier which yep. is going to make him more concentrated yep. more focused on actually getting his target and i was like that's it right there like being active versus reactive yes. you know when the hunger comes obviously he's going to become an active 
animal. It's, it, it's what we call ignition training. Right. It's that, that fire that comes from within you. To get closer to the mic. The fire that comes from within your belly, bro. It's not something your parents say, hey, go do this. It's not something an employer. It's something that has to come from deep within you, man. And a lot of times those things are sparked in you at a young age or for whatever reason, man. That, that fire that comes to you, like... Like in Nipo Po, we have a lot of prerequisite reading. And thank goodness for audiobooks because I can't read shit. Yeah, me either, bro. <laughs> but one of the videos is about Buck, Buck Brandeman. He's a horse trainer. Oh, yeah, he's awesome. A million, brilliant dude. But he came from a very, very violent background. Like, I have very similar existence, man, how I got into this shit. Like, I, I was indoctrinated into this life by violence. Like, my old man punted my, my mother down the street, on the street, the stairs when she was pregnant with me, bro. Like, all I knew was this violence and dysfunction, substance abuse, alcoholism. So for me, like humans were dangerous as shit, like untrustworthy, manipulative. So animals spoke my language, right? So that I always had this desire to connect with animals. Actually, horses were my first love, bro. That's what it was about for me. So, but that that has always been a deep desire in me. And a lot of it's to get the fuck out of the environment that you're in. And, and sometimes you can't even articulate why you're doing what you're doing, but it is such a deep passion within you to do shit and it happens with the dogs too and what happened in that bird story is that his hunger activated ignition bro he's not gonna go pout in a tree right and wait for that fucking worm to you know jump in his mouth bro he's gonna be activated compelled with a deep intrinsic desire to survive to go activate and hunt his shit so the ignition training in nipo po is, is amazing bro like and that's kind of the nipo po comes from the old system bro it's negative and e means negative Po means positive, so negative, positive, positive. Is the old school system, it's evolved into a newer version of more free shaping and more brain games and the more creativity and, and making the dog active and a, and a handler reactive. And it's, uh, it, it is about empowering the animal to manipulate you and its environment to fulfill its predatory needs and instincts, right? And it's a very powerful moment. But once that ignition's installed and you make a professional problem solver, like you make the dog so in, in, in tune with these brain games that you can't trick the dog, bro. All the shaping games. And it, maybe it's nothing you're going to use in a later behavior, just abstract fucking like they grab a fucking bottle or jump on a table or run around a cone, like agility shit, like problem solving stuff. Like you're clicking nonsense, bro. But it's empowering the animal to be creative. Right. And then once that fire is installed and the, and the creativity is installed, then you go to the old system, which is luring, right? Putting the dog in positions that you know how to get away the chip away those thousands and thousands of reps, man, that it takes. Yeah. I think, I, I think, yeah, I do it. I mean, I think what we talked about it before I've, I, I do it like where I start with a little bit of luring and then I, I do feel like shaping is a very important piece of the puzzle. I mean the, you know, where the dog, cause you, you literally, I feel like they become smarter by figuring shit out. Gotta struggle. And so, um, but I, I tend to lure a lot and then I just expect them to almost, you know, get, figure it out on their own and i so i do it a little bit backwards or whatever but I do some somewhat shit. the same idea i do some shit that's a uh, contradictory i call it lure assisted free shaping <laughs> what how does that work it does it's it, so basically you get ignition in the animal right like exactly the way I explained and then you like if i wanted to run around this bottle like i'll show it a little bit yeah show, yeah, yeah, yeah show it a little bit and then step the fuck out yep. and let them figure it out like the struggle is so important that's the power in free shaping is that when the animal has to struggle to find the sweet spot it is so much more clear in their brain about how to get there the next time. Right. I use like a GPS signal. Like we're lost in LA out here, bro. Siri's a liar, bro. She's had us <laughs> lost and run in circles. But if the satellites go down and my phone takes a shit, bro, we don't have the access to a GPS. Right. Now we're free shaped, right? So we're going to drive around and say, go to the gas station. Hey, where's, where's Oscar's place at elevated? And they're going to give us shitty directions. We're going to get lost again. And, bounce around get super frustrated we're late for class we're late for the podcast and we're we're pissed off but then we finally find our way here right i don't need that fucking see i don't need siri or anybody to tell me how to get here because i struggled so hard to figure out my way home and get to my my location my destination is that that frustration burned that information into my brain it's like i don't need help right and that's kind of the, the power of free shaping man like you I, think that um uh if say a dog is a uh, you're, you're free shaping with a dog. He, it's creating frustration, so he becomes a little bit vocal and this and that. You know, uh, are you going to create more problems? Could so because, for example, if I'm going to teach my dog to go around this thing, I will usually stand here, so where the dog literally only has one option, and he does it on his own. I'll click, and then I'll lure him, finish it off. I let him start again and figure it out again. So it's almost like. 
I feel like I try to make it easier for them to figure it out. Yeah. It's almost like I'm box. setting them up, but, yes. you know, but they're figuring it out. Oh, in their mind, they're the ones, you know, kind of figuring I it out. I cheat it even more, bro. Like I'll make, I'll do the corner of a room and put the cone or the bottle in a corner. I seen you. Yeah, I seen you do that. And I'll throw the food back there. And the food's going to ping pong around. And whatever food that kind of rolls to one side, I'm leaning over the other side with my lure ready. So it goes on one side. I see that it kicks to the right. I'm hanging left, Mark. And the dog starts to learn that pattern. You can also step in there and lure, but you're using a Skinner box right. basically to squeeze the environment to hit the target behavior. But I think that's a huge part of the system, how it's, a, how it's changed. So it used to be negative reinforcement with leash pressure, low stem with lure. But I think a lot of the dogs, especially you know, obviously the dogs you get your hands on, are, the, the ignition is when the sperm hit the egg, bro. Like, a thousand percent. It's born. It's born. Somebody asked me that about the puppy. How do I get my puppy to do that? I said... That's just genetics. Yeah. I didn't do nothing to that puppy. Yeah. That's just when the sperm hit the egg. And I got that from you. So now I always repeat it. <laughs> I stole it. When the sperm, yeah, when the sperm hit the egg. Um, yeah. So one of the one of the my biggest struggles and one of the biggest struggles that I see with a bunch of people is the the leaking part of it. Mm. Do you think so there's like certain life skills? I I you know, I got this from I want to say Forrest. And he said, you know, skills over behaviors. So a skill would be the dog being aroused and then settling down, yep. shut off. Yep. And I've exercised that with my my uh, my recent dogs, but I don't know if it's because they are not as crazy as Guapo, or I just, or is it because I just never did that with Guapo? Because Guapo is always on. I yeah. mean, he's always on. And these dogs, I'm able to like put them on a sit and they'll be shaking and everything, but they'll stay there. So it, I feel like it was, it's a new skill that I've added with my last two dogs, which, you know, it's going to be what, four years ago yeah. that ha has changed the game. Did you, did you load me. him and then squeeze him? Yes. Yeah. So, so, and, and so instead of doing like one full session of him just being on the whole time, I could do uh, a short session of maybe two minutes and then I'll put him on a down. Yeah. And then I just, get on my phone, start editing a video. I go back to it again, yep. over and over and over until where he learns. Capping he can go up, again. he comes down, he goes up, he goes right. down. And and I feel like even with, with pet dogs, a lot of people are super excited to train their dogs. They're so into it that they just dump a whole bunch of dopamine and adrenaline to this dog and they never work on that skill. And that's what we call popo knee. Load, 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 and then... And then you get active submission and, and pets, you know? Yeah. But I think, you know, again, for me, we have personal dogs. We have time. We're not chasing a, a clock on a board and train or a patrol school. We got to get things done on a timeline. And, you know, that's kind of what we do in our system. We, we present the long game options, which a lot of people don't want to take. <laughs> and then we can present the short solutions that we can see results quickly. Yeah. You know, one of the things I liked about what you guys did was that you started with the dog being quiet. Yeah. I have to. And some people, I mean, they, tend to just want to go to the dog being active and then getting them to be quiet. And I think I thought for me, that's something that I haven't done that I probably are. I mean, I, I do it without even thinking about it, but I haven't been like with my clients, with my dogs. I feel like I do it, but with my client dogs, I feel like I'm just like, all right, let's get started. Let's go. Yeah. But you know, I think, sorry, I'm getting far from the mic. I think sometimes those dogs that have been loaded in prey barking and then we bottle it. <laughs> There's even better aggression at right. the fence. Like you, you, the puppies have to be taught to be audible. And there was a girl that was sitting in the front row of my class. She was a really smart kid. And she was asking really quite good questions like that. Well, what if you have a puppy that's not barking yet? Well, we have to sometimes instigate some prey barking to let them understand that an audible expression can move things in your environment. And of course, age and maturity has a lot to do with it. But I think there, and initially there has to be some reactive training to make the animal understand, hey, this is a fun game that satisfies my predatory instincts. I'm about this. But then the, the game has to switch for the dog to become active and move us. Right? That's very important. But sometimes, like these puppies that we get that have been loaded and prey barking, they're, I mean, we see every dog that he gets his hands on from a vendor has been put on a back tie, and whoosh, whoosh, lion agitation, screaming in prey, and getting paid for that behavior. Sometimes that the byproduct of that, when you do make the squeeze, poof, it's power, man. Yeah, it's, it's almost like getting a Coke bottle. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, 
and it scares people. They say, you know, I don't want my, I want my dog to bark and like, trust me, we'll get them to bark. We'll allow them to bark, but it's, it's gotta be on command. It's gotta be on command or in a couple circumstances where we allow it. Otherwise, you know, it, it's just, it's prey barking and right. they're not clear. It's confusion. And, and like Justin said, we, we bottle it and then, you know, we have that much more power. Yeah. Um, somebody asked, uh, at the seminar, he was a little shy. He didn't want to ask, you know, in front of everybody or whatever. He's like, so do you think that the dog has to be barking like that in order to, you know, do well on the street? And I feel like, I mean, there's some dogs that are just basically, like you said, I mean, you could probably go uh, certain sports and go straight off prey and they'll do fine. And I'm guessing in the street, the same thing. Some dogs just yep. with over the top prey could probably just do. Oh yeah. The prey monsters are are the dogs that, I think are like the one percenters, the ones that see they don't, it's hard to get emotion out of them behind a bark fence because they just see you as like, they're trying to lure you in so you can get closer so they can bite you. They're not threatened. Like almost no matter what you throw at them, everything's a big fuzzy bunny rabbit that they just want to bite. And those dogs absolutely can perform on the street and perform very well. Uh, I think the barking, it, we, you can get them to bark and we've had a lot of dogs, you know, come through the seminars that people are like, my dog's a mute and he's not going to bark. And in the first session where, you know, the dog's barking. barking. Yeah. But um, we can get them to bark and probably bring out a little bit of power and some clarity and teach some neutrality to the team and all that behind the bark fence. But does the dog really need it? I don't know. Not every single dog needs it. But, you know, that brings up another point. Like I've had people without problems that come and say, you know, that dog is, he's a lot of dog. So I don't want to do anything to bring him up another level. And I feel the opposite. I think if you have out problems with that dog, let's fix the out, clean it up. Then we'll teach him to bark and put him on another planet where he's way, way up here and then still make him out. And then, then the dog really understands like, okay, no matter what's going on, I need to out. So we, we have friends that, um, or, you know, trainers in the special force community, and, and they look for quiet dogs. Right. That's what I was going to ask next. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Some... So those dogs can be silent assassins their entire mm -hmm. career. And they, they probably have to wash dogs that are can do every aspect of the job, but they they loot too leaky. And I think one of their first testings, the first part of the selection test they do is they walk through the kennel. The dog's parking and spinning. They keep moving. Don't even bring them out. And, um, you know, there's, there's techniques and ways to quiet dogs up and, and – you know, I, I talked to one of my friends that's in that, that program and I try to express or, um, you know, explain to him the, the forced fetch and Nipo Po. And it's got so many benefits to it. But a dog that's a little bit leaky you know, in, in sport, bro, if the dogs leak, you know, you lose points and some clarity. But on target, if the dogs leak, you know, like people die. Like they have to make the approach to target in silence. So I'm thinking, why can't we teach? Again, I've never been in that environment, but my brain starts thinking like a dog trainer. So how can we get those dogs quiet in those environments? And these tools are, are very beneficial, but I think if we give the dog a default behavior, like a forced fetch, like you can carry a wooden dowel in your pocket, <laughs> make the dog hold that shit on your approach to the target. And when the flashbangs go off or everything starts raining down, they know you're there. So the dog can spit and go handle business. Like you can absolutely squeeze the dog vocally by teaching him that forced fetch. Like using positive punishment or aversive control to close the dog's mouth is an option. But a lot of times that shit's like Tourette's. And we talked about the, the hormonal expression of the dogs being on another level. And the moment the dog leaks on target when your hands are on your rifle and you can't manage the positive punishment, then they know they got you. But right. if they have the default behavior of holding something, it's important. But back to capping for a second. I think capping a dog's brain that's in forward active aggression where their drive channels are clear is way easier than capping a prey hysterical brain. Got it. Big time, bro, because they're in the right gear. And not just capping, getting any obedience, yeah. outing, anything. They're clear. Because yeah. their, their, their predatory instincts are online. Like, it's not natural from the bark and prey. And when you reward that bite and prey, the act of barking and prey, you're re rewarding and marking that emotion of hysteria. And that tran that continues through the gripping behavior. It continues in the, in the healing behavior, whatever you're trying to do. So... Yeah, it's like uh, capping for the soul, bro. <laughs> it makes sense to the animal when you do it that way. Yeah, I definitely. I mean, for me, it's definitely one of the since it's one of the things that has has cost me the most. Oh yeah. For when it comes to sport, I'm like that's one of the things that I like. Now I'm gonna make sure I nip in the butt from the beginning. But if you could go back right now and make Guapo quiet, would you? 
A thousand percent. It's like a trademark, though, bro. Bro, he could <laughs> hey, he could scream without with, with being able to you turn be, it yeah, on. bro, I'll be able to turn it off. <laughs> I feel like maybe yeah. I don't know. We'll see. We'll find out with his son. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. You know what I'm saying? Very but cool. um, all right, cool. So I know we we uh, we got some questions. We still got you guys got time? Yeah, bro. Yeah. Yeah. All right. It'll be in Phoenix tomorrow, man. So all right. So let me see. We got, we got some questions that you guys asked online. All right, so we got some questions on Instagram, and this one is for Justin. How do you work purgatory when you're in public and don't have a spotter? Well, what we do is in Nipopo, man, somebody along the line invented the flex pole. If it's a it's a spike that goes in the, like deep in the ground, like 18 yep, inches, yep, yep. it's got a well, little wide be base. Before that, why don't you explain to the people that don't know uh, what that is? I'm and then cover purgatory. Purgatory is an exercise in indirect pressure. And it's utilized for secondary obedience during bite sports or healing and patrol dogs. With a big prize of a decoy being on the field, it's very difficult for the dog to stay in behavior. And I always try to put myself in the dog's position no matter what we're doing, right? I try to think dog, right? So you have a dog that's a four-legged missile that traverses this earth with great speed and dexterity, right? They can move like fast, fast, fast. They're, they are absolute incredible athletes. We're asking him to walk next to a two-legged fat fuck that trips over himself and stumbles, right? So the marrying of a human, the gates of a human to a dog is not easy on its face, right? So now we want performance, we want precision. Now we're gonna add the big prize of an indirect reward of the decoy, right? Not easy. So a lot of times these dogs leak and fade from healing involuntarily. Like it's just almost like a Tourette's, bro. Like even the topography of the ground may sink you go down the dog goes up you think it broke healing and the common uh punishment or correction that folks use is correcting the dog in position now imagine that you're doing a job and you're thinking you're doing it well and you get punished for it right the job is going to become unfun so what happens is the dog starts to learn that but being next to you causes discomfort like being next to your leg in that healing position now all of a sudden you've loaded it you've made a tremendous amount of reward history and repetitions there and all of a sudden doesn't feel so great right so now that creates a conflict within the pack but the dog starts to say eh about that spot so what we use indirect pressure so what the, the system is for purgatory is the decoys in a suit ideally you can do it in sleeve no matter what uh, ideally decoys in a suit and has a flexi leash like a giant 25 foot beefy flexi leash that's attached to the dog's first saver or flat collar it's really an anchor for most dogs Dogs are absolute beasts, one percenters. They're, the dog is attached to a dominant slip on the flexi. But a dog that heals on the left side is going to heal clock, counterclockwise around the decoy at the end circumference of the flexi leash. Now, before that even starts, the decoy must know that team's perfect healing picture, right? And everybody heals a little bit differently. What I tell people is to imagine a box next to the handler. Inside that imaginary invisible box is perfect healing. We have to maybe come out without the decoy to see it. And in fairness to the dog, they must be fluent in indirect reward, right? Because that's what the whole setup is. So now that we've established a baseline healing, the decoy's responsibility is to hold that dog accountable for the slightest leak and disconnect of that perfect healing picture. It could be a whisker sticking out of that box, a paw, an ear, a tail, whatever it may be. If that dog vacates slightly from that position, the decoy is going to set the hook on the flexi and pull the dog out of healing position. And what's cool about this is the handler can have their chin up, shoulder square in that competition picture, and all of a sudden, body snatched. The dog's ghosted from next to him. And I always tell the handlers, take another step or two and have that like mentality or that chemistry be like, like, where'd you go, bro? What happened? And now the dog's out in no man's land, in purgatory, like going to suffer the sins, suffer the consequences of his sins. And even a strong dog, bro, getting vacated from pack can send a dog for that OODA loop. It's crazy, bro. Even dogs you think are monsters, all of a sudden they're removed from the pack situation and it just sends them for another another spin. Now, I, construct, I instruct the handler to so then turn towards the, de the dog and decoy and face with, with a square shoulders because if this is a healing picture that the dog sees, like your shoulder, now they're seeing the front of your body. No healing's happening. Like you've now lost your chance to heal. Then it's the handler's responsibility to apply, apply the level of pressure necessary for that dog in that moment. And they have to know that. And what we're looking for in the dog's body language is to have some submission to the decoy, turn their back and say, all right, all right, I'm good. Can we talk about this healing, right? So when we see that picture in the dog's brain that they're saying, okay, now you're relevant again, 
Now I want to get back home. The handler then squares back up and shows that picture. Hey, we're healing in this direction. Gives them access to it. Yes. Now you're welcome to come home and heal. And with most dogs, it's very effective. Now that, that one percenter may need prong from the, from the handler. And, and the handler's cadence of corrections has to be no correction. No correction. The world comes to a crashing halt, bro. This isn't pop, 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 get back in position. No, this is, it's over. And it doesn't feel great. And it happens away from the handler. So now it's the dog's mentality is, man, I can't wait to get home. I can't wait to have that harmony and neutrality restored. And then once the dog's given permission to return to the heel position, they get there, the dog is marked and then sent for a bite indirectly, right? So the payment's established and the nuances of the system are pretty detailed. I won't eat up time to answer this individual's question, but it's long story short is, is the dog ob obtains or experiences pressure out of the target behavior. And then when they achieve their way home, the pressure has relieved. There's harmony, neutrality, and big paychecks for coming back home. The way you set this up, if you're by yourself, is with that flex pole, right? So again, it's a big spike that goes in the ground. It's got a big base that sits on top of the ground, and it looks like a gigantic fishing pole. Like yeah, you could look field. it up, uh, gap pay they got one. flex pole, okay. yeah. And then the beauty of it is it has a hasp that you can hook into the dog's collar that the dog can run around and jump around and won't get hogtied up in the yeah. Up in the yeah, yeah, yeah. So what you could do is have your bite pillow in the inside circumference of the, of the flexi, flex pole, and you're healing. Like, let's say the dog's healing on the left. You're making counterclockwise turns about the maximum circumference of the flex, uh, the flex pole. And if the dog makes a mistake, you step out of that radius and you utilize the anchor of the flex pole to add your corrections. Pop, pop, pop. And you see the dog go, okay, okay. You step back in radius, heal. I teach that to create more drive. Yeah, 100%, <laughs> yeah. bro. I've seen people step out and, and crack the whip with their own dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, again, and the dog has a mindset. It's like, it, your, like your engagement is going to go through the roof because we're going to be like, when's this dude going to dip? When's he going to yeah, dip, yeah. right? So, but then they can send the dog indirectly for the pillow, bite and reestablish. Yeah. Um, that's how I would set it up if I was by myself. Cool. I like it. I like it. Yeah, I almost got destroyed doing that with a new dog. I saw that video, bro. <laughs> I sent you the video, yeah. <laughs> I was standing outside. We had a new dog doing it. And so it's his first time. And uh, uh, I started video, and I'm like, I'm going to send this to Justin. It's, gonna, you know, it's going well. It was my first time doing it, too. So um, but the handler sends the dog, and in, instead of the dog going for the decoy, the dog whoop, makes a turn right to me, and I'm looking at my phone, so I don't oh, even shit. see it coming. But the decoy was quick on the button and was able to stop him on the flexi. And then he turned around and went and got the decoy. But man, the dog said, "You're not behind that fence now, mother." <laughs> <laughs> kill that bald guy. Oh, that man. bald guy has pissed me off. <laughs> Let's see another one. Main things to focus on when you first get a mal puppy. That should be a question for you. You got some? No, I'm. I you have got no a experience <laughs> with puppies. Um, I mean. What do I focus on? I feel like I've been doing all the same stuff over and over again with all my last puppies. I get them out. I try to let them see as much as the world as possible. Um, I don't baby them. I don't over. I'm gonna say I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't give in to them. You know, crying and barking. Want to get out? I only get them out of the crate when they're quiet. My training sessions are usually separated in a way where if I'm gonna work on luring or what positions or whatever that's one training session away from it if uh you know if the dog is biting me like and i'm getting tired of it i'll correct them right there on the spot i don't i'm not with the whole you know don't correct them for biting yep. and redirect and all that i correct them right off the bat that correction could look different for whatever dogs or whatever i have around yesterday i got this lemon the lemon spray and i freaking yeah. sprayed them and it he worked. stopped yeah it worked While yeah biting you he was biting me, and while he was biting me, I freaking sprayed him, oh, yeah. and he got off. And he's like, <laughs> he's like that. And then he just forgot about it. He forgot that he was biting me, and you know, and I just let him know, hey man, cut it out. I mean, that's I feel like that's how I communicate with the dog. I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not. How can I, people are super strict on you have to mark it and this? I go, hey, what the fuck? And he understands what I'm talking about, you know. <laughs> what about interactions? Excuse, with excuse other? my French. Uh, you're all right, bro. Um, Dropped enough f bombs. What about interactions with other dogs? He's hanging out with all my grown dogs right now. Uh, I I let him. I leave him with his dad. I know. I know that 
Guapo's really good with young dogs, so I've been leaving him out with him, and he hangs out with him. I think it's contagious, bro. That chemistry from a strong dog is contagious. A thousand, they learn so much from him, man. Even from a boarding train, bro. Like my, I had two patrol dogs at one time. You know, my black dog, he he, he had to put him down, you know, years ago. But I would get a nerve bag in for for pet training, mm -hmm. and their crate would go right between those two monsters. Like a thousand bro. percent, and I don't have to do shit. And they're like. I feel this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Royal knows. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the time when we have dogs that are super insecure, I'm like, hey, bring out one of your dogs. Work them with one of your dogs yeah. if they work together well and just start training your dog and neglect that one. Yes. Until he's like begging for you yes. to, to pay attention to him. And it's only a matter of minutes where you got him doing all kinds of shit, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I, that's how I work dogs that are a little bit insecure. Along with moving, I move a lot. Like, you know, yeah. keep them moving, keep them moving, keep them moving. But anyways, going back to the young puppy, I mean, like this this dog, uh, he's going to be a sport dog. So I'm going to do play sessions with him where I'm just playing tug with him, yeah. two different tugs. Um, I start tossing the ball. He brings it back to me. I play with him. I mean, there's nothing. I don't have this set schedule with him. Anytime I have, uh, you know, time to train him, I'll train him. But I also don't give in to him always wanting that attention. Mm -hmm. When he see he's seeking so much attention, I'm like, nah, yeah. I'm not going to give it to you right now. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of <laughs> yeah. how I work. I don't think a wolf hunts and eats at the same time every day. You know, I think that mixing and matching of schedules keeps the hope and anticipation hot. And, you know, I saw, and it's, it's not rocket science shit. I saw he had a meal or half a meal on top of that picnic table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little shit like that. Yeah, I mean, I knew that he hadn't been, you know, he hadn't been, uh, he'd probably never seen that. Yeah. So I, have you know, took the opportunity to dump a bunch of food there and just yep. put him up there and wobbled around a little bit. And then he was fine with it. So I do take opportunities uh, when I, like today, he picked up a stick I, and I, and he held on to it. I'm like, oh shit, I like that. Yep. So what do I do? I played with it a little bit. I made him out it and I, Tossed it. He went. He picked it up, and then I ran back the other way, and he was carrying it the whole time. So little things like that that I start creating and shaping behaviors yep. with things that he is naturally already doing. I do a lot of that type of stuff, uh, and I and I was doing the same thing with Guapo. I remember Guapo as a at that age, bro. I could hide a stick, put my scent on it, and I'd tell somebody, "Hold him. I'm gonna go hide this thing." I'd hide it, and he'd find it. Okay. And it was, you know, it. Bro, a little piece of stick yeah, and, yeah. and a bunch of other sticks around. Right, right. And so naturally the dogs have it. And it's just how do you capitalize on what mm -hmm. they're already giving you, you know? Right. <clears throat> How are you going to teach them out? What's your go-to technique? Um, I teach it as soon as they are biting and gripping without a problem. I teach them to out. I, <coughs> I try to show them the same exact picture of like I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing. I stop. And then I stay there, and if I make it uncomfortable because I put the tug right next to my leg, so I'm so he does like his mouth is right against it, mm -hmm. and then they start messing around. They sometimes let go. I mark that and I play again right away, and I show him that picture where he understands the picture that I stop. That means you're gonna eventually let go. Mm -hmm. Once he's doing that over and over and over and over again, I put it on cue, cool. and then I proof it. I'll put it there. Once I know that he knows it, I put it on there. He doesn't let go. I play again and I put it on there. And when he's about to let go, I might cue him. He'll let go. And I play again. I do it all through play. Yeah. Everything is through play. And again, I don't even like have a, I don't have like a written system. I just kind of go with what I have. Like my last two dogs, I could say they could be running. I say done. Poof, they spit it out. They look at it. They stare at it. They stare at it. Get it. And then yeah. they, they play again. Good. And I do that over and over and over. And it just, it just happens. Very cool. Man. And at some point, he doesn't let go he will get corrected and i think you'll understand that like back to them biting and stuff bro like his mama tagged him a thousand percent he still went back in for <laughs> affection and yeah and and every and i think you know everybody's gonna there's a certain way that you're gonna communicate with your dogs and without like and i got it from my buddy juan he's like bro i don't know what you do with your dogs they all look the same in certain things that you do right. and i said i don't even know what i do but it's something that we do that yep dogs get it pick up on it um so i definitely feel like like yeah they just anyways yeah how do you get your dog comfortable to pee anywhere she's a fearful dog and only goes in the bushes by my house it's been five months since i rescued her from the shelter she was astray and is now potty trained 
but we'll hold her pee until we get back from wherever we went to go pee in the bushes. It's like this dude. He can hold his poop all day and poops in the hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to damn gas station, bro. Like, I don't care. Yeah. Oh, this is my Uber driver. We're stopping every 10 minutes. To <laughs> it's it's tense going go right down. Now, yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> That's a that's a tough one, man. I have to figure out some way. I, is it the bush itself or is it the location? You know. Yeah. If it's the bush, bro, I'd say take some leaves and shit with you. <laughs> and <laughs> sprinkle some of them over there. Like, you know, that's something I have to tinker with, bro. Like sometimes these these questions are, are aren't. There's not a blanket answer. I kind of got to be in the moment. It could be some dumb shit they're doing. Right. You know, and um, and it's time, bro. Like we can come up with a theory. An explanation, oh, you get the bush, get the leaves, get a pee pad, some crap like that. But does a person have the time to dedicate to doing that shit? I just I just feel like is it making it um is it really messing up what you like your schedule? Yeah. Or is it really you know fuck I mean, let her. It's holding. Yeah, I mean if she's holding it, right, let her. Unless it's gonna, you know, if you're gonna be gone, I'm sure if you left her for boarding somewhere, she's eventually gonna pee. Gonna go. Yeah. yeah. So I mean I would just yeah. What do you think, Eric? Yeah, same. I mean eventually she's gonna go somewhere. I, I might take away the opportunity for her to pee on that bush and you know, see what happens. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So maybe don't let her go to that bush and yep. just take her somewhere else until she does it. And then yeah. just make a big, huge deal about it when she does, yep. you know, be prepared with treats and just a bunch of praise and, um, and but, talk to her, let her know she can do it. Have yeah. a, have a discussion with, and you know, <laughs> slip line too, you know, if she's that fearful going out, I find that, um, people take their dogs out and their dog doesn't want to go outside and they, and they let the dog win and just right. let them go back inside. Like, no, I'm putting the slip line on and we're, we're a little going for this walk mm -hmm. and a little bit of half to, you know, and, and next thing you know, 10, 20 steps later, the dog's like, oh, okay, this is cool. You right. Know, this ain't so bad. Could you? So taking away that option. Could you collect some urine? Like as a dog's going, have some tongs and a paper towel and <laughs> Put that shit in another location so the dog goes, oh, maybe I peed here. Like, bro, you have to come up with some mad scientist shit. Yeah, yeah that's not a bad idea. <laughs> Teach it to pee in the house. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This one, uh, for both of you guys, we'll go with Eric first. Obedience first or bite work? Yes. Simultaneous. <laughs> yeah, same time. Same time. So there, it's all happening at the same time. Yeah, I mean, it's like you, know, you asked me about the out. I think it depends on the dog, right? Like mm -hmm. the dog must be, you know, possessing, holding that's, everything before you want to teach the out. The dog that's still in your van. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. still in your van. Yeah. <laughs> but keep in mind, like my answer is coming maybe from a little different perspective than you guys. My the dogs I'm getting are mature police dogs. I mean, they're not police dogs yet, but they're green dogs. You know, they might be green, yeah, but thirteen months, fourteen months. I'm not messing with puppies. So a puppy, it might be something completely different. And I'm not even going to speak on that, but I think you can build them both at the same time and right. not losing any power. I agree with, with these older dogs. Now, uh, do you find yourself having to change the cue all the time because it's been so tainted already? Like, you know, I, I feel like when dogs come from kennels and all that, you know, the loss or whatever, and it's already paired with the dog with some fighting from the dog every single time do you find yourself having to change the cues yeah it happens sometimes especially with dogs that have out problems that you know come from elsewhere but you know something i've been doing more recently is is preloading that so using a throwaway term a generic term that we're going to get rid of so if i'm teaching a dog to to out and i'm doing it with a police dog that's a little more mature they're going to get corrections that they don't understand in the very beginning so i'm going to tell them to drop or let go of the toy and they don't know what that means so then i'm going to correct them for not doing it and they they don't really understand it so for that i'm going to use a throwaway term like the term drop and the dog's going to learn to out on the word drop and once it's they're doing it perfectly then i'm going to change the cue to los or aus or whatever we want it to be and um, I feel like some of the baggage that's associated with the word drop goes away with the command. All right. So the last question, what is it? What are the first steps when dealing with resource guarding? Well, I kind of want to know what, what it is they're guarding. You know, if it's food, it's simple. I mean, Larry, um, not Larry Crone, we were just talking about Larry. And he actually said a, made a real nice post about oh, you. Oh, I know. I've seen that. He's a good guy. Um, Love that dude. <laughs> um, Dave Croyer um, made a fucking hilarious video about this shit, man. He, like, don't fuck with him. Well, he made a post like he's going to have this like 
game changing theory about food resource gardening or food. Oh agreement. yeah, yeah, I seen that. Bro, it was hilarious, dude. He's like, it's in his living room. There's a crate in the living room. He walks into the bowl of food, tells the dog to get into a crate, gives him the food, close the crate, walks out the door. <laughs> that <laughs> that's how you, yeah, that's, that's how you get that's rid of it, bro. It. Like that's it, you know. And you know, a lot of the techniques to stop that food aggression kind of make it worse. Um, but there's a post going around our Nipopo group about how the dopamine box started. Mm -hmm. It started because of that. Like the dog sees you as competition trying to take its food, right? And that's why it defends its, its Yeah, I mean, I I feel like it feels like it's going to be taken away and right. he doesn't want that. Yeah, so. and it, and it maybe it stems from, and the person that posted it's got a bloodhound puppy that's maybe nine weeks old, bro, and he is going for it when you go near his food. Really? Yeah, so the, obviously you're a competition, you're a threat for that, that, that asset that he's acquired. So the dopamine box theory, I believe, was started over that shit. So the dog... We want the dog to trust the hands the opposite, that the hands are delivering food into your, your place. Right. And the box gives the dog blinders, right? So with just an open bowl, the dog can see everything coming. But when the dog's in the bottom of the box trying to get food, its, it's eyes are below the box. So it's kind of got a, a funnel. And then it starts to learn that the hands are there to add food. So that's like the reverse psychology. Yeah. So but for me, man, for the average dog owner, feed him and it's great. And take him out when he's done. Yep, yep, over. yep. Yeah, I think there's some people that automatically feel like if he growls at me, I need to literally like you know put yeah. hands on him yeah. uh, to to stop it because he can't be the alpha. Right. Basically, and it's know. the only time in that dog's life where it's demonstrating that behavior. Just isolate it while it's eating. Do you think that uh, not nipping that behavior there is going to cause issues with other animals in other places? Whether it just be, I don't know, shade even. Yeah. Well, for me, when it comes to aggression or like serious like reactivity, man, you're, there's no tool or technique, theory or system that's going to delete that from the dog's database. It's always lurking within them. And the tools allow you to mitigate and manage those impulses. So the minute that the guard is down or there's a, a competing reinforcer or there's some deeper trigger or the dog matures and just decides today's the day, like it's still going to happen. So yeah. I just say it's about mitigation and management. And it's over toys or if it's over bones or, or that shit, guess what? No toys, no bones. <laughs> you yeah. chose that life, right? For the average pet owner, you know. I know they want, for, maybe the folks want, if they are a trainer, if they want, like, like advice, it, it would be this tool. Because as we explained, you know, prong and e can put a dog in another level of aggression. Yeah. Um, when you restrict blood and oxygen to the brain, it's a whole different, whole different outcome. So this would be a double handling situation with one, maybe two of these in play, opposing each other, or putting the dog in a situation where it's gonna understand that that's uh, be regret mm -hmm. making those choices. And like when Eric and I are on the fence too with a lot of police dogs, sometimes they will redirect on their handler. So we will string this through the fence on the decoy side and it's attached to the dog. And I'm very big on pe keeping people safe. So what we use is a rubber prosthetic arm um, we use it for you know teaching the dog to bite that kind of surface that's kind of mimics flesh. But we also use it for have the handler put it in the dog's space, like almost like they're petting the dog right. when they're active. If they go to turn, then we make the dog understand that's a bad choice. Same thing with the resource guarding stuff, keeping people safe, put that rubber arm in the dog's face. But all that shit sometimes just makes it worse. Yep, yep, yep. What, what, are, your, what are your guys' thoughts on uh, an existential food reward system, hand feeding the dog? You think that's going to help at all? I think it does help. Yeah, yeah. I think it does help. Different uh, context, because the dog hasn't acquired the, the jack. Yeah, one, one of the things, like you said, I mean, one of the things that I, I like to do with, with certain people is like, if it's, it happens in the crate, then you say he's eating his kibble, don't feed him out of the bowl because that automatically might trigger him. So just put the kibble in there. And when you walk by, just drop something that's of higher value over and over and over and over. Like walk by, which I mean, the box is mm -hmm. almost the same Similar thing if you think about it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you normally it, it gets better. But out of the bowl, I think there's a connection with the bowl already engraved that gotta like you know take care of it steel my my little foster puppy that i have if i'm training him and another dog comes close he fucking goes nuts mm. he goes after them yep. so i go how do i fix how do i fix this and then i i threw a bunch of food on the my turf and i had them all find it and he just like didn't want them to do this so i go okay there's a problem there how am i gonna fix it so first when i'm training him now i have a leash on him put the slip leash on him mm. 
And as the other dogs are getting closer, I see him looking. And right away, I just stop it. I pay the other dogs, matter of fact, and then I pay him. And now he's like, you know what? I don't, I don't, and, and I don't make it a big deal. I don't, I'm not, I don't, you know. And then when it, when it was in the grass, the same thing, he was getting all crazy with the other dogs. And I just, again, I have that communication with him. I'm like, hey, cut it out. And he's like, I didn't have to, you know, I didn't, I don't have this special marker. He just knows that when I go, hey, cut it out, that, that I mean business. And uh, he showed it twice. I told him to cut it out. And after that, he was fine. Then he's eating. I'm throwing more food. I'm petting them now. And all the dogs are eating around the same place. And he was fine with it. So I think it's just if you have that communication with your dog where he understands, like, what you mean, like what he can and can't do, I think that they get it pretty fast. But the problem is that I feel like people don't have that relationship with the dog because they they have never actually applied a correction that means something to the dog. Mm. And so they don't have that to go to. Right. And that's the problem. He's from the streets too, bro. You can't blame him. I, I and I was like, I could see it. He was gangster, bro. I could see it. I could see it. As soon as I, I was training him, and the other dog comes by, he's like, Rawr! he's like going after them. And then he comes back to me, like, "What's up? We're still working." And I'm just like, bro, no, he's he's definitely gangster, bro. And you see him. It's funny because the other dogs are like about to step on him, and this motherfucker moves all fast. You know, you know he's, he gets away, bro. He's he's gangster, bro. Well, look, man, we're getting long in the tooth, but I just want to tell you from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of Eric, bro, we're so yeah, grateful for the fact that you opened up your spot to us. It's an amazing facility. It's the second time you've done it for me, bro. Yeah, man. And uh, I'm beyond grateful, bro. It's an absolute privilege to come out here and, and hang with you and train. And, you know, I tell people all the time, I was telling Eric on the way out, like the Cali culture is, is deep, bro. There's parts of this country where, you know, I've seen a lot of different things and the dog culture is, is an amazing thing going on out here, bro. And you're, in the, you're the Mecca. You're the middle of it. Awesome, man. Appreciate you guys being out here. Um, Eric, bro, it's a pleasure meeting you. Yeah, you too. Thanks so much for everything. Yeah, you know, man. Just, anytime and you're in Florida. For sure, know. I'll be dropping by. And, bro, this is your home. Like I said, if you want to host something here. I got You got my mind spinning this, about this your, gold this is here. This is your spot, bro. Oh, thank you, and, man. Uh, awesome. yeah, man, I appreciate you guys, all the knowledge you guys bring to the table. I know everybody appreciated it, uh, you know, having you guys out here. I think everybody took something from it. And uh, let's do it again, man. Oh, brother. Thank Sounds you so great. much. All right. All right. Thank All right, guys. We'll see you guys on the next one. Thanks for checking it out. Remember, make sure you guys check out Canine Culture Collective as well as Underdog. Elevate your mind. Elevate your canine. <laughs> let's get it. This that go and get it. With no hesitation. This that never quit. Start that elevation. This that process.